We are racing towards the global crisis at the close. God is going to set up His kingdom on earth. Preparation for the tribulation and the translation is to develop a character like Jesus Christ, to reach every hamlet, every village, every man, every child, every person in India, every person in South America must hear these three angels' messages. These are stories that illustrate the kind of fabric of character and perseverance that we need to go through the tribulation just as certainly as they did. The Bible makes it very clear we are living in an unusual hour. The last grains of sand are trickling through the hourglass of time and the door of probation is about to swing shut. In this edition of Amazing Prophecies, we are going to explore my topic tonight, showdown in Babylon. Showdown in Babylon. Before we go to ancient Babylon, however, let's go to ancient Egypt. Are you ready? It's the cheapest ticket you'll ever get. Were the ancient Egyptians healthy? What do you think is the resounding answer to that one? In 1975, a team of specialists performed autopsies on Egyptian mummies at the Manchester Medical School in England in that museum. And these mummies, they discovered, dated back to 1900 years BC, what does that mean? Before Christ. The ancient Egyptians suffered from many illnesses that are common to man today. They discovered that the prevalent diseases in ancient Egypt run parallel today, of course, heart disease, cancer, obesity, high blood pressure, diabetes, arthritis, hepatitis. So then, Egypt was the educational and cultural center of the world during Moses' lifetime. And ancient Egyptian medical knowledge and remedies were, if you don't mind me making it plain, they were downright crazy. A matter of fact, in 1552, the famous medical book written in Egypt was Papyrus Ebers, and this book lists scores of remedies or cures for a host of diseases, infections, and accidents. And this was barbaric medicine, I must say. Ancient Egyptian medicine and health is an interesting, fascinating study. A matter of fact, this book rep uh, recommends a prescription for slivers. All you have to do is a combination of rubbing worm's blood and horse dung into the wound, and you should be all set, according to this book. Uh, for a snake bite, no problem. Drink water, just pour it over an idol first. And for lost hair, listen up, men. Rub into the scalp a tonic of horse hoofs, date blossoms, and dog heels. It's got to be boiled in oil, and then you'll have your remedy for the day. Well, Moses was educated in all the wisdom of the Egyptians, according to Acts 7 and verse 22. However, consider the stark contrast between his inspired first five books of the Bible and the prescription for optimum health and vitality. Compare that to what was prevalent knowledge and medical cures among the ancient Egyptians. Their cures there contrast with the prevention mode of health in God's Word. Uh, consider this. Moses was 120 years old when he died. His eyes were not dim, nor his natural vigor abated. Deuteronomy 34, 7. A matter of fact, this man Moses, at the age of 120, you remember, he climbed the mountain, and then after that long hike up that mountain at the age of 120, what's your excuse? He, there at the top, fell asleep. The Bible calls death but asleep fell asleep in the Lord's arms, as it were. His mental, his mental acuteness, his mental uh, rationing power, his discrimination, his memory, his, his eyesight was just fine. How many would like to be like Moses? Amen? Well, you better start hiking. You know, we spend billions and billions of dollars on health care, but it seems like we're no better off than the ancient Egyptians. 
we spend $500 billion dollars by 2020, according to a source, United Health, U.S. of Diabetes, November 2010. Uh, so we're in a financial crisis and a financial crunch largely due to our unhealthy habits, our unhealthy lifestyle practices. It is costing us, well, it skyrocketed. On an average day, 2,000 Americans die of heart disease, 1,000 Americans die of cancer, 400 Americans die from strokes. That's a day in the life in America. Want some sobering facts? I got them here for you tonight. Americans are profoundly unhealthy. One in five smoke. I was among them. One in four adults is obese. One in five adults has cholesterol levels above 200. And preventable illnesses make up approximately 80% of the burden of illness and 90% of all health care costs. We are digging our grave with our fort here in America. And indeed, most diseases are preventable. Hmm. Diabetes statistics by 2020, an estimated 52% of the adult population will have diabetes or pre-diabetes. Wow, we're no better off than the ancient Egyptians. The cost of diabetes, a whopping $174 billion. Total cost of diagnosed diabetes in the United States in 2007. So what is one of Americans' most nagging fear about their health? That horrible, fear-inducing word, cancer. How many have known someone who have died of cancer or who have been diagnosed with cancer? Raise your hand. That's a far vast majority of us. Many turn to pills without names they cannot, with names they cannot pronounce and with side effects they cannot compute. The big question is, is health a matter of chance or choice? What do you think? Yell it out. Choice. Do our lifestyle choices really make a decisive difference? Our greatest need is not a pill. Our greatest need is for a lifestyle. So therefore, there are simply and only two types of approaches to life. Indulging in the flesh and destroying your health, trashing your health, or have a life of self-discipline and self-control in the spirit. How many agree you can't go both ways? It's either the spirit or the flesh that will rule. Is that clear? Yes or no? The evidence is clear that this is a generation of instant gratification and lack of all self-restraint and self-discipline. We reap what we sow to the flesh and the spirit. Galatians 6 verse 7 makes it very clear. God is not mocked. A man will reap what he sows. So let's sow right. What do you say? So what is in the news every day? Health news. Well, there were, I know it can be uh, confusing, the bewildering array, the barrage of all sorts of research, incredible uh, uh, you know, physicians getting on, or credible uh, medical researchers saying this, that, and the other thing. They seem to contradict. But through it all, the average American has an opportunity to know a lot about how to be healthy. Well, guess what? Front page Time Magazine, a while back, The Science of Staying Healthy healthy, want to keep the doctors away, new discoveries can help prevent everything from obesity to cancer to heart disease. I mean, come on, it's in the news, front page. So I got a question for you. Despite all the knowledge about health, we are still an unhealthy society because knowledge, we're not following it. There's a con contradiction. Would you agree our gener generation is the personification of contradiction. Why? What did the Apostle Paul predict would be one of the chief characteristics of people in the last days that impacts their health? Well, go with me to 2 Timothy chapter 3. You want to learn something tonight? Say you do. 2 Timothy chapter 3. But know this, that in the last days, that's where we're at, Perilous times, that is times of, in my Bible, it says times of stress. But what 
causes the stress. Would you agree? Stress is a killer. Stress can kill you if it's excessive. Notice, but know this, that in the last days, perilous times will come. And then he gives a litany, a catalog of 19 prevailing sins that will, that, that will permeate God, uh, the last day generation. For men will be lovers of themselves. Lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving. Keep that in mind. Unforgiving. Hmm, does that have an impact on health? Can a bitter person result in bitter health? Notice here, the, the Bible says here as we continue with this litany, this long laundry list of prevailing sins, without self-control. Slanders without self-control. That really sums up what's going on here in America. We are without self-control. We have gone wild, out of bounds. Notice here, unforgiving, unloving. Would you agree being an unloving person can really, really wreak havoc on your health and take a toll on your body? I want you to notice here, because love is healing, amen? Love is healing. Say that with me. Love is healing, amen? And I want you to notice here, slanders without, listen to this, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, notice that headstrong, that's kind of like you, you, you know better, but you're headstrong going in the wrong direction. Notice here, uh, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure, that's the problem. We love pleasure so much, we don't care what it's doing to our health. Notice here, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but denying its power, and from such men or from such people turn away. What is Paul saying? He's saying that these people that are without self control, even many of them have a form of godliness, but they don't have the power of a transformed, changed life. Would you agree? We need to have power to have self control, power to, to, to take care of our body, power to overcome addictions, power to resist the pull of indulging in unhealthy appetites. And so I want you to notice here, I want you to notice here, the American Standard Diet is a, hmm, there's an acronym for you, American Standard Diet, uh, the Standard American Diet is a sad diet. Americans eat an average of, and I, I, just, I just find this absolutely astounding, an average of 32 teaspoons of sugar each day in their foods. Now, some of y'all are eating my share of sugar. It got quiet all of a sudden. You say, don't be messing with my chocolate. A U.S. Department of Agriculture. Well, let me tell you something. One little, one little piece of chocolate isn't going to ruin you, but we go beyond that apparently. 32 teaspoons of sugar each day in their food. Can you say sugar high leads to sugar low, which lead to sugar blues? No wonder jazz is popular. Smoking-related diseases claim over 393,000 American lives each day, each year. Cigarette smoke contains over... 4,800 chemicals, 69 of which are known to cause cancer. And I am just appalled that I actually was a chimney at one time. You know, smoke coming out of every, every crack and crevice. I mean, uh, I smoke two packs of cigarettes of uh, a Viceroy. I don't know if they make it anymore. I don't know. But uh, all I know is, let me tell you something, even though they tasted horrible sometimes, I was addicted. I know what it's like to be addicted. I know what it's like to be ruled and controlled by this passion of the flesh to inhale smoke. I thought you call the fire department when there's smoke in the house. All right. We are a generation of addictions. And by the way, you can overcome smoking. I overcame smoking by the power of decision. I wish I could say that I'd given my heart to the Lord and then uh, quit smoking, but 
even before I gave my heart to the Lord, I made a decision. I am sick and tired of being sick and tired. I am through with smoking. And at the same time, I quit being basically almost like an alcoholic. I quit drinking. I quit smoking. I quit toking. I quit those illicit drugs. I did it all in one shot. I know that there is power in decision. Thank God that I have Jesus Christ to keep me that way. Amen? Because many people, you know, they quit, but then they lapse back into it. How many agree? Jesus keeps you from falling. Jude, verse 24. So there's a generation of addictions of today. You know, there's two big lies that are very prevalent. You know, the Bible says in Revelation chapter 12, Revelation 12, verse 9 says that the devil, the devil was kissed, kicked out of heaven. And what does the Bible tell us? He came down here to earth. We opened the door to him and opened the floodgates of woe and sin and suffering. And what happened as a direct result of this? He is deceiving us. He is the deceiver. Revelation 12, 7 and 9 makes it very clear that he deceived one third of the celestial host. Would you agree? He's really got this, uh, the, this science of, of deception. He's got it really perfected. And so there are two big lies that he has hatched. It doesn't matter how I treat my body. Number two, I can't have victory over these bad habits. Would you agree? The truth shall set us free. If the Son sets you free, you are free indeed. I like to say forever free. Can you say amen? That's John 8 and verse 36. So what did Jesus say about those living in the end of time? Well, take your Bible and turn with me to Luke chapter 21. We've got to keep our foot on the accelerator tonight. Is that okay? And so we're going to cover a lot of territory here in this very important subject. So we're looking here at Luke chapter 21 and verse 34. But take heed to yourselves, lest your hearts be weighed down with carousing, that is dissipation, drunkenness, that is uh, affecting your thinking, your thinking is not clear, uh, drunkenness, and drunkenness is not just from consumption of alcohol, you can eat in such a way where you cloud your brain. Hmm? Is that true? How many agree? You can eat so much sugar, you almost go into shock. Right? It doesn't just take alcohol to, to impair your reason and judgment. People are, I believe, not only drunk today because of alcohol consumption, but they're also being drunk by their poor lifestyle choices and their, and their uh, customary diet and, and what they're eating there. There's death in the kitchen, that's all I can say. And so I want you to notice here, drunkenness, drunkenness. In other words, it's possible for a person after they go there and have five Big Macs and, and a couple of milkshakes and french fries and so forth, it's possible after that, you know what, you cannot even think straight. All you want to do is lay down in front of the TV. I call that drunkenness. And cares of this life. That sounds like stress. And that day come on you unexpectedly. For it will come as a snare on all those who dwell on the face of the whole earth. Watch, therefore, and pray always. The, the main idea about taking care of our body is so that we can pray always lest we enter into big time, end time de deceptions and temptations. Would you agree? You need to have that clear mind. You need to be able to have a clear mind to discern temptation and resist it and to be able to discern the voice of God and to pray to God morning, noon, and night to pray without ceasing. Pray always. Pray always. Would you agree? It helps have a clear mind when you want to pray. And so I want you to notice here, this is the antithesis of, of, of drunkenness and, and carousing. Notice, pray always, watch, stay alert, stay sober, that you may be counted worthy to escape all these things that will come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. All right, now take your Bible and turn with me to Luke chapter 17. Luke chapter 17. So, so Jesus was talking about Earth's final generation and the deplorable social condition that would exist in the last days. I want you to notice here in Luke chapter 17. Luke chapter 17, we're looking there now at verses number 26 and onward. And as it was in the days of Noah, so it will also be in the days of the Son of Man. They ate. 
They drank. They married wives. They were given in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. Same thing in the days of Lot. Likewise, as it was also in the days of Lot. They ate, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted and built. I want you to notice now Matthew 24. Go with me to Matthew chapter 24, where we have kind of a parallel to this here. In uh, Matthew 24, verse 36. But as the days of Noah were, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. We're talking about the second coming of Christ, the climax of the ages. How many are pulsating with that blessed hope, the glorious appearing of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, Titus 2.13. But as the days of Noah were, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. For as the days before the flood, what were they doing? What were they doing? They were eating. Well, you got to eat. Yeah, but they were taking it to excess. Not only that, they were eating the wrong things, I believe, many times. And drinking. you got to drink. Your body is, consists largely of water. What about 80% of our body is water? And much of the illnesses common today, I believe, are attributable to us walking around dehydrated. We don't, we don't drink enough. And so, drink enough uh, water, that is. And so, I want you to notice here, by the way, you need about 8 to 10 glasses of water a day. And when it's hot out and you're outside sweating, you need more than that. Notice here. Notice here. Eating and drinking marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark. Notice that. And giving in marriage. Notice. And did not know until the flood came and took them all away. So also will it be when the Son of Man comes, will the coming of the Son of Man be. Jesus makes a striking, ominous parallel between the social conditions that prevailed in the time of Noah and the days of Lot in Sodom and Gomorrah and our day, our generation, American culture, and our society. We have much social ills because we are mirroring or mimicking or should I say a repeat performance of what was in existence in the days of Noah. Jesus predicted it and it's happening. Would you agree you can take the Bible in one hand and your remote control to CNN, Fox News, whatever, with the other hand, and you can see an eerie match. I'm going to agree we must be willing to be different. Come out from among them and be ye separate, says the Lord. And then I will receive you and be a father to you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, 2 Corinthians 6, and verses 16 and 17. And so, uh, what are two major problems with how Americans eat? Uh, you know, I told one man, or, or I was in a home, and I don't know, somewhere along the way, I said, uh, you know, you are what you eat. And he said, well, then I'm a potato chip. All right. <laughs> uh, that was in Rolla, Missouri, by the way. <clears throat> All right. Eating the wrong food. That's what we're doing. That's what we're guilty of. Eating the wrong food or eating too much food or both. You know, Esau was tested over appetite and foolishly, he put food before his love to God and was willing to give up his birthright. In other words, he was willing to say, I don't care about the future. I'll give it all up. I'll give everything up if I can just go ahead and have instant gratification in the here and the now. If everyone would make decisions based on time and eternity and destiny, let me tell you something, we would make better choices. We have to make choices that are seeds sown in a positive way in character development. The only thing we take to heaven is our character and the choices we make, including lifestyle choices, uh, make up who we are. Our character is made up of the sum total of our choices. And our choices are a reflection of where the heart is. And the Bible's very clear that God will have a people that have put on the robe of Christ's righteousness and they want to do what pleases Jesus. They put on His robe. The wife hath made herself ready. What is that robe? Revelation 19, 7 and 9. We have focused on that several times. What is that robe? That's Christ's righteousness. How does she get ready? By putting that on. What does that mean? She wants to be like Jesus. Well, did Jesus have self-control? Did Jesus indulge in appetite? No. Would you agree Jesus is our shining example? 
His power is in our heart. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. 1 John 4, 4. You can overcome because he overcame. People are throwing it all away. Come on now. Our character consists largely of what defines us? Our habits. And there are, you know, some habits are not necessarily the most critical habits, like what shoe do you usually put on first? What's your habit? It really is of no consequence. Um, do you exercise or not? Uh, now, now we're getting in the big leagues. Uh, do you drink water? Now, now we're, we're talking major concern here. I want you to think about this. What is the connect between the books of Daniel and Revelation and healthful living? You say, Mark, you've got to really show me this one. Well, I want you to notice very clearly that it was Jesus who said that in the last days there would be drunkenness, there'd be, Paul said, stress, lack of self-control. It all translates into daily lifestyle choices. So, th so that's connected with Bible prophecy. Would you agree Jesus saying about our day would be like the days of Noah? That is prophecy. But let's go now to Revelation. Let's go now to the book of Revelation. Let's go to the book of Revelation. All right. And let's look there at Revelation chapter 14. Revelation chapter 14, verses 6 and 7. In the center of the book of Revelation, you have here depicted in graphic symbolic language uh, Earth's final call, Earth's final call, God's last messages of mercy that are pictured by these three angels that are doing flyovers on planet earth. And these are messages, these are messages that must go to earth's remotest bounds. They must circle the globe swiftly before Jesus comes. And included in these messages is what? Is it prophetic? It is. Is it practical? It is. Is it the gospel? Yes, the eternal gospel. Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to do what? Preach to those who dwell on the earth, and to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, it's compelling, it's urgent, fear God, and give what? Glory to Him, for the hour of His judgment has come. And here it is, underline it, highlight it, memorize it. Worship him who made or created heaven and earth, the sea and the springs of waters. Would you agree? He made you. He created you. And here we are called to worship the one who made us after his image. How many are thankful he made you like him? Can you say amen? After his image. I want you to notice here. This is the everlasting gospel to preach to every nation. But what is embraced in that gospel message? What is embraced? The health message. A healthy lifestyle. Doesn't God want us to be healthy, full of vitality, be able to have concentration ability, be able to think clearly, have some vitality, some vim and vigor and and energy. How many would like a little more energy? Can I hear an amen if you could have enough energy? All right, very good. Beloved, I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health. God wants us to be healthy. Third John verse 2. Jesus said, I am come that they might have life and that they might have it, what everyone more abundantly, John 10 and verse 10. That's in the heart of God. So does God want us to celebrate our health every day? Psalms 146, verse 2. Read it together with me. While I live, I will praise the Lord. I will sing praises to my God while I have my being. Would you agree? Our being is made for praising God because He's worthy of our love. He's worthy of our worship. The Lamb was slain. We were made by our Creator. He is worthy of our adoration and our praise. And would you agree, the way you take care of your body, that is one way you honor God, you worship God, you obey God. And so, what was one of the primary ways Jesus ministered to people in conjunction with Him preaching the good news? Jesus is the same yesterday, today, forever. Hebrews 13, verse 8. Jesus is the lover of the sinner. 
Jesus is the lover of our soul. And Jesus cares about our health. He cares. He feels. The Bible says in Isaiah 63, verse 9, it says, in all our affliction, He was afflicted. How many agree Jesus has feelings? When you hurt, He hurts. Now, I don't understand how there can be joy in heaven over one sinner that repents in one second and another person is suffering, dying on their bed of cancer. I don't know. I'll ask God and you'll ask God, you know, how, how are you able to do that? You know, be happy and sad at the same time. I don't know. But all I know is I will not limit God. But let me ask you this. If you have children, who suffers more? When your child suffers, who suffers more? Your child or you? The parent. Think about that when the Bible says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. How many agree? The father suffered with his son. So what was one of the primary ways Jesus ministered to people? Look at this scripture in uh, Matthew 4, verse 23. Now Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom. And what's the next word? And. Everybody say and. And, in other words, by implication, that's saying, uh, we're not done yet, uh, we're not finished yet, uh, we're not finished with the full gospel. How many want the whole gospel? Nothing but the gospel truth. What's, what is included in that preaching? And healing. Preaching and healing. Healing and preaching. Preaching and healing all kinds of sickness and all kinds of diseases among the people. Matthew 4. Verse 23, no wonder crowds gathered around to hear Jesus preach. So all, now the woman, this woman, being a daughter of Abraham whom Satan has bound. That's where suffering, suffering comes from. Think of it, for 18 years, be loose from this bond on the, on what day did he work this miracle? Sabbath. The Sabbath is a day for miracles. Amen? <clears throat> so that's uh, Luke 13, verse 16. He healed on the Sabbath. And uh, he got a bad rap for that, you remember. <clears throat> what did Jesus tell the disciples to do in addition to their preaching of the gospel? What did he tell them? Heal the sick. Remember, he dispatched, he commissioned, he mobilized the disciples, the 70 were to go out and preach and teach, and they came back all happy and joyful, I mean, just unbridled joy at, at what they were able to accomplish in the mighty name of Jesus. And so Jesus told them, don't just preach, you go out and you heal. You work miracles in my name. Preach in the gospel and healing everywhere. Luke 9, 6, that's what Jesus did, that's what the disciples did. And that's what is included in the three angels' mission and message that must go around the world before Jesus comes to prepare a people ready to meet the Lord in all His blazing glory, because without holiness, no man shall see the Lord. Hebrews 12, verse 14. So listen carefully. Take your Bible and turn with me to a book that's easy for me to remember, Mark. All right, let's go to the book of Mark, chapter 16, the last chapter in that book. <clears throat> okay, we're going to go there. If you have it, uh, it's uh, Mark, chapter 16. Mark, chapter 16. All right. All right, Mark, chapter 16. And this is powerful. Are we learning something tonight? Amen. Mark 16, verse, six, uh, verse 15. And he said to them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Isn't that what we read there in Revelation 14, verse 6 and 7 about the eternal gospel, the three angels' messages uh, going around the world before Jesus comes? Notice here, he's, this is the gospel commission. He who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. Now, during this series of, of Bible prophecy lectures, We've already had a couple of baptisms, and, and I'm going to invite you. I'm going to invite you. We're going to have another baptism this Sabbath. And I invite you to be part of that baptism. Either A, you've never been baptized like Jesus, or B, you want to be rebaptized just like I was. And so I want you to notice here that preaching and baptism are inseparable here. Do you see that? 
the preaching of the gospel, and the response of the gospel is baptism, taking a stand for Jesus. But that's not all. And these signs will follow those who believe in my name. They will cast out demons. They will speak with new languages. Those are real languages that were there in Acts chapter 2, Acts chapter 10, Acts chapter 19. These were real, authentic languages that were understood by uh, these various uh, uh, language groups that were gathered together on the day of Pentecost, for example. And we have a little book, if you're interested in that particular subject, that you can receive. But let's go on here. They will take up serpents, and if they drink anything deadly, it will by no means hurt them. Notice the next part. They will lay hands on the sick, and they will recover. What is this telling us? The Bible is telling us, preach the gospel. Baptize, cast out demons, lay hands on the sick. James chapter 5 talks about that. Anoint them with oil and the prayer of faith shall save the sick. And so here we are talking about healing of sickness, healing of diseases, healing of whatever physical maladies or physical uh, disabilities someone can have. Uh, God is still in the business of healing. However, parenthetically, we don't always understand God's will. Why does He heal some and others He doesn't heal? Is it just because, well, some lack faith and some don't? Well, there might be a little element of truth in that, but let's be careful. The Apostle Paul, do you think he had faith, yes or no? He had a thorn in the flesh, as he called it. In 2 Corinthians 12, 9 and 10 in there, you remember he sought the Lord and pleaded with the Lord to deliver him from this thorn of the flesh, this, this, this problem, this physical ailment that he had. And he prayed that he would be delivered from it three times, and the Lord said, my grace is sufficient for you. He was not healed of that disease liability. He wasn't healed. I don't understand all that. We don't have answers to every question that nags us but we have enough answers to keep walking by faith and not by sight. 2 Corinthians 5, 7. Yes, we're going to have a millennium to ask questions. How many are thankful? The books are going to be open and we can ask any question and get those answered and then the new Jerusalem shall descend with the tree of life in it that has leaves for the healing of the nations. All right, let's go on. So can you see the unique, unbeatable combination Preaching the gospel, baptism in the name of the Father, Son, Jesus Christ, and of the Holy Spirit by immersion, and in addition to that, the healthy lifestyle healing program of God. You say, Mark, what are you talking about? Healing program and so forth. How comprehensive is the healing of Christ? How comprehensive is it? You remember on one occasion, once again on a Sabbath, there was a man paralyzed that was laying down by the pool of Bethesda, and uh, he was in a paralyzed condition for 38 long, horrible years. Jesus came to him and said, would you like to get better? Would you like to be made well? That's the ultimate rhetorical question, but I think Jesus needs to ask it of All of us, do you really want to get better? Because some people really don't want to get better. And the proof is, they just keep doing what they're doing, digging their grave. So he said, get up and walk. And this man responded to the word of Christ. He responded to the command of Jesus to get up and walk. In other words, he set his will in motion. He made a decision, I will follow the word of Jesus. There is healing in the word of God. By his stripes we are healed. Where did you learn that? The word. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing of the word of God. Romans 10, 17. We receive according to our faith. Matthew 9, 29. So we must have faith to receive healing. Let me make it clear. Faith is healing. It's healing. Now, don't get me wrong. Paul had that. That didn't remove his thorn of flesh, but I'll tell you what, there was still healing in his heart. Still healing in his heart. 
because some people who come down with a physical disease, they become bitter towards God, and then it really eats them up. And so we are in an imperfect world, but listen to what he said to this man. See, you have been made well. This was the follow-up to the miracle. See, you have been made well. Sin no more, lest the worst thing come upon you. What was Jesus saying to this man? He's saying, now you're better, you've been delivered, you have your health restored, now don't go back to the destructive habits that got you in that deplorable condition in the first place. Don't go back to your unhealthy lifestyle choices. Whatever sins he was committing before led him into this paralyzed condition, this paralysis. And so the Lord said, don't destroy your health that has now been restored. But you know what happens all the time. Somebody will quit smoking. They, 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 they get their life together. They start exercising. But once they start to see, hey, I think I'm going to be all right, they go right back to those bad habits and then end up dying prematurely. It happens all the time. So what is God's healing program? This is a thrilling, fantastic all-encompassing healing program. Does God heal? He does. As a matter of fact, speaking about Egypt, I want you to take your Bible and turn with me to uh, Exodus. Exodus. All righty? Um, you know, Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Well, basically, here's what the Scripture says in Exodus. Uh, well, let's go to it. Exodus 15. Exodus 15, all right? Turn there. Are we learning something tonight? Exodus chapter 15. Exodus 15. All right. We'll look at it here together. Exodus chapter 15. And looking there, verse 26. And said, if you diligently heed the voice of the Lord your God, there's healing in the word of God, if you obey it, and do what is right in his sight, give ear to his commandments, and keep all his statutes, I will put none of the diseases, none of the diseases on you which I have brought on the Egyptians, everyone together. For I am the Lord who heals you. How does He heal us? By obedience to His commandments, and His commandments are written on every fiber of our being. There are laws that govern our body. There's a law a law that governs your digestion. When you break those laws, guess what? You get indigestion. Can you say Pepto-Bismol? There's laws that govern our central nervous system. And when you drink too much caffeine that attacks the central nervous system, can you say, I got shakes? Or I'm wired? <laughs> And so we know that there's laws that govern our being. There are laws that govern our being in terms of needing rest. There are laws that govern our being in terms of the use of our muscles. Would you agree you use it or you? It's a law, a trophy, right? Instead of the muscle going up, it starts to go down. All right, go ahead and hide your arms. God's healing program is obedience to His Word, obedience to His commands. His commands are promises. Would you agree you can't do anything without His power? When He commands you to do something, Jesus said, without me, you can do nothing, John 15, verse 5. But Paul said, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, Philippians 4, 13. My grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect, my power is made perfect in weakness, 2 Corinthians 12. 9 and 10. Let the weak say, I am strong. Joel 3, verse 10. Now listen carefully. We must obey God's law in order to have health. These are health laws. Now, God's healing program, it adds life to your years and years to your life. Physical, spiritual, mental, emotional, social creatures. Would you agree? Not only monkeys are social creatures, we are. Amen? Amen? We are spiritual creatures, physical creatures, made after the image of God. We're dealing with mental health, physical health, spiritual health, emotional health. 
and social health. So, physical and spiritual healing are embraced in the Gospel, in Christ, in His Word. The Bible talks about, in Psalms 103, it talks about forgives all their sins and heals all their diseases. Guilt can sap your energy and your vital force and wreak havoc to your immune system. Guilt can kill you. When your mind is at dis-ease, you come down with disease. When your mind is restless, you end up with sickness. And so forgiveness is healing. Would you agree there is healing in the Gospel and there is healing in this house tonight. There is restoration in this house tonight. There are miracles in this house tonight because perhaps some of you need to be once and for all liberated from the shackles of, and, and the debilitation of guilt. And, and, and shame and remorse. It's time to go on with a sure step knowing it's all left to the foot of the cross, unburdened at the foot of the cross. You go on your way dancing and praising God. You've been delivered. You are forever free. Would you agree that's healing? You and I need that healing. It affects us. Would you agree when you accept Jesus Christ, it affects you positively, physically, mentally, emotionally, spiritually, socially. Would you agree? Oh yeah, you might be persecuted, but you still have joy because you're being persecuted. Because the joy of the Lord is our strength. Depressed and discouraged people are more likely to become addicted. Is that true? Because our, we lose our will. We, we begin to say, oh well, come on. That's what I did. I, you know, I, uh, I was living, shacking up with my girlfriend. <clears throat> Matter of fact, uh, Mark Findlay, I understand recently, uh, actually a couple years ago, shared my testimony on Discoveries 8, and it's true. I, uh, I was living with a girlfriend, and I wanted to marry her, but she didn't feel the same way I did. Can you say humble pie? I was a broken man and had a broken, shattered heart. And I wasn't following Jesus. I was living in sin. My parents, my father, a pastor. That didn't look good. He and his associate pastor there in Hartford, Connecticut were trying to tell me, Mark, if you want God to bless this relationship, you've got to cease living in sin. You've got to move out of there. Start going back to church. Well, I remember. I remember. I, uh, I decided I'm going to quit smoking and drinking and drugs for the relationship. I figured it would help. She didn't ask me to, but I thought, you know, this is bound to, to, to benefit this relationship. One week after I did that, she said, I need time to think. I'm going, you know, I'm, I don't know how it came out, but it kind of leaked out. She was going away to see her old boyfriend so she could have time to think. I called up my buddies. And I said, come on over. And I, this was one week after I quit all that stuff. Would you agree? When you begin to have victory, the devil gets angry and enraged. And so I gave in. Why? Because I was discouraged. I was depressed. And I was not going to be alone in that apartment, brooding over and licking my wounds. I said, man, I'm going out and party and try to forget all this. So I called up my buddy. You know, drinking buddies are always available. Always, 24-7, especially in the night or early morning. So I call them up, you know, of course they had drugs, and we went out to a bar and drank, and I smoked, and I talked, and came back. She was gone still. And I practically passed out, woke up in the morning, and I was sick as a dog visiting the restroom. The mind, my, my, my ceiling spinning around, spinning around, and I'm making trips to the restroom, and I'm trying to blast the rock music to drown out the pain because now I had two prevailing problems. Uh, she was gone, and I had a hangover. The devil's way never solves problems. It compounds it but I never touched smoking and drinking of drugs ever since that lonely, lonely morning. I said, I'm sick of this. And then I started attending. Eventually, when I moved out, told her we gotta have God in our relationship. I thought, well, maybe God can straighten her out. 
He ended up straightening me out and leading me and her to separate. God is in control. But depressed and discouraged people are more likely to become addicted. Many diseases originate in the mind. Thank God for the healing of the everlasting gospel and the healing of Jesus Christ. Depression is the epidemic of our day. And I'm here to tell you the strongest antidote, the strongest remedy, the strongest way out of depression is knowing that Jesus Christ has set you forever free. Free. Let go of bitterness. Let go of bitterness. Would you agree? Bitterness has to do with not letting go of the past. And Paul said, forget the things that are behind. Press on. Press on. Philippians 3, 13 and 14. Front cover story at Newsweek magazine a number of years ago. The new science of mind and body. Forgiveness and health. Stress and infertility. Uh, rethinking hypnosis. Uh, no thanks. Cures to heart disease. In other words, there's a connection between forgiveness and health. No surprise that a healthy marriage is extremely good for your total health. I've done my research. Uh, you know, men, for example, men, for example, who feel that their wife loves them, their heart ticks better. Go ahead, do the Google, do the search. They are better off health-wise. Same women who have a troublesome marriage, stressed out marriage and so forth, it does take a toll on their health as well. So all I can say is kiss up and make up, it'll give you longevity. Stress is a killer. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28. Peace I give to you. Not as the world give I give to, do I give to you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. I give you my peace. John 16, uh, 14, and verse, uh, John 14, verse 27. How many are thankful for this peace that passeth understanding? Philippians 4, 6 and 7. If you give him all your anxieties, casting all your care upon him because he cares for you. 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse uh, 6 and 7. A merry heart. A merry heart does good like a prescription. This is a prescription from Dr. Jesus. And by the way, I hope you have a regular visit with Dr. Jesus and get a checkup every day. How many agree with mental health issues? You need to get a checkup every day with Counselor Jesus. Somebody's going to go home with some good news tonight. A merry heart does good like a healing medicine. Like a healing medicine. Proverbs 17, 22. You want to know a fact? Children laugh over 200 times a day. I know that. I have two children. I know that. Sometimes I have to tell them, you know, don't be so silly. <laughs> um, and some of it is just, just good humor. You know, sometimes it goes overboard, but nonetheless, we go underboard. The average adult laughs about 12 or 13 times a day. And you've really done probably more here tonight. I don't know. Listen, listen to me. Jesus said, except you become like children, humble, and perhaps so lighthearted in Jesus' love that you actually find a desire to laugh with joy. I'm not talking about dark jokes. I'm not talking about off-colored uh, you know, humor. I'm talking about going to the zoo and laughing your tail off. I don't know, if you don't laugh when you go to a zoo, something's really wrong. You need some counseling. See me afterwards. Come on now, you cannot look at an ape with a serious face. And when you, it's in you swirling in your mind, uh, you came from apes, you think, you got to laugh at that one, right? Say, I am much better looking. What does it mean to glorify God? Remember it says there in Revelation 14, it says, fear God and give glory to Him. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 10, 31, in all that you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it to the glory of God. So giving glory to God includes 
Making wise decisions in regard to what I take into my body. Because, 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20. Let's go there. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20. Are we learning something tonight? 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20. This is Paul speaking. And we're going there. All right. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20. Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit? Does the Bible say in the last days people would be grieving the Holy Spirit? Ephesians 4.30. Just like they did in the days of Noah. They grieved the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit was withdrawn. Genesis 6.3. And one of the reasons why the Holy Spirit was withdrawn is because they were trashing and trampling the temple of the Spirit of God. They were ruining their, bi their bodies with foul practices and eating and drinking the wrong things and eating and drinking to excess so that the Holy Spirit could not dwell in their temple. And so the Bible makes it very clear, the Bible makes it very clear that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. Would you agree? That's holy. Who is in you, whom you have from God. You are not your own. You know, sometimes people say, well, it's my body. No, it's not. It belongs to God. It belongs to God, just like we call this temple. What do we call it? God's house. This is not your house. This is not my house. This is God's house. I'm going to agree this is holy. You don't just do anything in His house. And we don't just do anything we want with His house, the temple of God. Can you say amen? If you want more of the Holy Spirit, then respect the temple of the Holy Spirit. Would you agree we need the early and the latter rain? And that means you better make room for the Holy Spirit in your temple. For you were bought at a price. That's the cross I need to close. That you were bought at a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Is it clear in light of the cross, in light of the blood of Calvary, in light of the sacrifice of Christ, what is the Bible saying? In light of the fact you've been bought at an infinite price. The price of Christ's precious life. In light of that price, that was paid for your body, that was paid for your entire being, in light of that, glorify God in your body because it's a temple of the Spirit. It belongs to God. So nobody can tell me, oh, that's legalistic what you're talking about. Oh, you're putting a yoke over us. No, no, no. In light of the cross, thank you, Jesus, that you set me free from being ruled by wrong eating, wrong drinking, bad habits, destructive practices. How many agree? If the sun sets you free, you're free, forever free. Although sudden and alarming changes are sweeping across the globe, you and your family can be prepared to face the future with confidence. The complete set of amazing prophecies on DVD are available for a gift of $60 or more. Call us at 1-855-336-FREE or send your check or money order to Forever Free Ministries, 2001 Monroe Park, Corinth, Texas, 76208. If you would like to have Mark Fox hold an Amazing Prophecy Seminar or a Marriage Seminar Weekend in your church, contact us today. Mark Fox at foreverfreeministries.org.